Good day, Thomas Jefferson Hour podcast listeners. As always, thank you so much for listening, and thank you so much, those of you who have decided to support the show. And if you'd like to do that, go to jeffersonhour.com, click on Donate, and there's a number of ways you can do it, or send us an email. We enjoy your comments, your criticisms, your suggestions, and I will tell you, I read everything every piece of mail that comes in. And while you're at jeffersonhour.com, you can find out more about Clay's upcoming humanities courses. In particular, the one that's relevant to this show, this week's episode, is Water in the West. And with that, I will hand it to you, sir. The subject just so interests me. I think four years ago, I did a retreat at Loxa Lodge, west of Missoula, one of the winter encampments on Water in the West. And at that time, I had discovered this book, Deadpool, uh, and Deadpool means when, when a reservoir gets so low that it can no longer be used. It can't generate power. It can't supply water for irrigation. It's now below the level that it needs to be at to do any of the things that a reservoir is meant to do. That's called Deadpool. And uh, James Lawrence Powell um, wrote this book in 2008, realizing that we're headed, we're headed there. And, of course, he, he proved to be absolutely prescient. Uh, these two reservoirs, Lake Mead and Lake Powell, are in uh, profound danger. And in fact, for the first time since the 1922 Colorado River Compact, there is rationing on the Colorado River. So and from 1922 until 2021, there had never been rationing of the river. There had been an allocation of it to different entities like Southern California or Arizona or the Upper Basin but no rationing. Well, now it's so low that for the first time the river is being rationed and we're only just beginning what's going to be decades of deficit uh, allocations for that river and others. And so, of course, um, when this happens, it could lead to out-migration. It could lead to water wars. It will certainly lead to massive litigation. There's talk of trying to bring water from the Columbia or all the way from Alaska or Canada Once you create Los Angeles and Phoenix and Tucson and so on, uh, they become water addicted for water they can't themselves produce. That water has to come from somewhere, and the supply since 1922 or so has been mostly the Colorado. Uh, That era is ending, and so it's a fascinating subject. We'll also, in this course, talk about the Ogallala Aquifer on the Great Plains, which is being drained, a, a fossil aquifer the size of Lake Huron, which is uh, slowly going out of business because it doesn't recharge and we've overtaxed it. And we'll talk about whether we've reached the point in American history when, when we begin to breach dams on the Snake or on the Columbia. You know, the salmon can't be restored unless certain dams are removed. And that's very difficult for American civilization and the American people to accept, but it's the case. And so James Lawrence Powell is an expert on all of this, and I asked him as I prepared to teach this course whether he would sit for an interview to really help me think about these questions. And he's just a, a gold mine of insight and also a very gentle and, and, and sweet-tempered person who who knows a great deal, but but in no way wears it on his sleeve. It's a great conversation. I hope listeners enjoy it. So let's go to the show. It's a one-on-one conversation between Clay Jenkinson and James Powell. Go to jeffersonhour.com for details on this course and everything else that we do. We so appreciate all of you. Let's go to this one-on-one interview with the author of Deadpool, James Lawrence Powell. Good day, citizens, and welcome to the Thomas Jefferson Hour. This week, another Clay Jenkinson one-on-one interview. Clay, tell me who you speak with this week. Uh, Thanks, David. I had the great pleasure of speaking with a dear friend of mine, James Lawrence Powell. No relation to John Wesley Powell, but focused on the same set of issues. And his book from 2008, Deadpool, Lake Powell, Global Warming, and the Future of Water in the West. It's about the Colorado River Basin, and he wrote it in 2008, which is which makes him a prophet. You know, even before global climate change became a, a, a significant uh, reality for all of us to face, we had over-allocated the Colorado River. There wasn't enough water in it even before climate change to, to satisfy all of its uh, users. And now with global climate change, it's become not just a problem, but a crisis, even a calamity. And James Lawrence Powell is the nation's leading expert on what will happen to the Colorado River 
as the global climate makes these very uh, disrupting changes. And so I had a chance to interview him, and he was uh, really remarkably uh, insightful about what we face. Let's go to that interview now. And when we come back, I, I know you have an upcoming online humanities course about water in the West, and I want you to tell people how they can find out more about that. But now, let's let's go to this conversation. You spoke with him via Zoom, right? I did. Let's, let's listen to this conversation with the extraordinary water historian, James Lawrence Powell. It's so good to see you again. Same here. How are things? Doing fine. Let me ask this question that sort of has been puzzling me all my adult life. Uh, <laughs> I, I read about how rivers operate. So if a river is moving too fast, it starts to cut beautiful S-curves and slow itself down. And if a river is traveling too slowly and it can't carry its sediment load, it cuts through and makes a, a, a beeline uh, until it reaches something called the profile of equilibrium. When you start to talk about that, how a river like the Little Missouri or the Snake or the Salmon, uh, before they incise, can perform in this way, it seems that, that there's an intentionality about that. It doesn't seem like that can be purely explained by hydrology. Am, am I wrong? Yes, I, I think you're, you're not right about that technically, but it, it's a very interesting question if you go to uh, i don't know the little little missouri but i i'm quite sure and i've seen some of your photographs and so forth um that if you uh go to the headwaters and then you you drew a straight line to the mouth well it flows into the missouri correct if you do uh, that straight line that's not the path that the little missouri follows and if you look at any mature river that is outside outside the mountains, like in the Great Plains or uh, elsewhere, where it's there, you're, it's relatively level. A river describes a a curve that produces these uh, sort of oxbow patterns. And on a really old river, like let's say the Lower Mississippi, you find that these oxbows bends have been cut off when the water in a flood went across the narrow section of the sort of the mouth of the oxbow and then stranded that oxbow. So you can see how they've, they've been there from the beginning. And that is a mathematical curve. That is the curve of least energy. And so rivers seek a path of equilibrium, as you said, our, our least energy, and it is that sort of sinusoid path. That that particular pattern has a has a mathematical description. Equation could define it. So, uh, so that's something rather remarkable about rivers is that they're always seeking that equilibrium point, always trying to do the least work to get to wherever they're going. But when you're in an uplifting plateau or in a high mountain in the high mountains of course they have so much energy they just plunge straight downhill and it's not until they get out on the beyond the the headwaters that they begin to do this meandering but you said the word seek yes that's a very <laughs> strange word for someone who's denying intentionality yes. here what yes. causes the river when it's roaring down towards its mouth from just cutting a beeline well, it does in, in the mountains, but when it gets down on the on flatter land, it, it, it's like you were racing to get to some point you were going to, uh, or you were skiing, let's say, maybe there's an analogy there. I'm not a skier, but you can plunge straight down or you can do the, uh, the salams, swoop around, and it, mathematically that turns out to expend the least energy. And natural systems, that's where they tend toward. It's to say seek, it anthropomorphizes it, and so technically no, but uh, that's a common way of expressing it. Just another remarkable thing about rivers. It is, and it does. Rivers invite a mystic response. I mean, Heraclitus famously said you can never step into the same river twice. A river meanders, that's a term from meditation. A river invites reverie, uh, whimsy, reflection, philosophy, doesn't it? Yes. 
And that may be why people like to sit beside them. And it does something uh, to your mindset and makes you perhaps think about larger issues than your own and how long the river has been there and how long it will be there and uh, what we gain by blocking them, damming them up and how long damming them up is going to be sustainable and so on and so forth. So you can think about them in a sort of mystical, philosophical way or a scientific way, and both are equally good. I feel somewhat the same way about the earth uh, as, uh, as something that, that I don't even, can't even put it in words. Now, I'm not as eloquent as you, Clay, but um, that the earth is also a system and a precious system, and it's our inheritance. And uh, we owe it to our grandchildren to protect it and get the most out of it while saving it for the for future generations. So I, f- I, f- I find it, it helps me to think about these things this way, rather than strictly from a scientific point of view. So we have thousands, even tens of thousands of dams in America. And it's, it, it can almost be said that we've dammed every available place. Many there, times. <laughs> there's room for a few more dams, maybe, but we sort of have, have topped out, not just in terms of national ethos, uh, national views of rivers, but even j- merely from a, the view of, of where you can place a dam and what sort of conditions have to be in place and how many a river can stand and so on. So is there a river in your world that you wish you could see untamed? Yes, uh, the Trinity River in Northern California, which is, just happens to be one that I know well. I used to have a house right on a, a bank of it. Uh, the Trinity is not a long river. It was a major steelhead stream. And of course, when you dam a river like that, the salmonid species, the steelhead and other kinds of salmon and different species, they can't get to their native breeding places or where, where they perpetuate themselves. Then we try to build fish ladders or we try to take fish from one spot to another. And in the case of the Trinity, that water goes to the Westlands Water District, an infamous organization, which uses it to grow unnecessary crops, alfalfa that we then put in big containers and ship to China our cotton, uh, our uh, almonds, and that's, that's another whole issue, but that would be one river I would like to see restored. But then near, near me, there is a small river called the Santa Inez River. Uh, the mission in this part of California was the Santa Inez Mission. I have seen pictures in the 40s where the steelhead were so thick that it's almost true that you could have walked across the river on the tops of on the tops of the steelhead, and and of course now we we've dammed that river, we've put in culverts and every sort of obstruction, as though if you tried to think of how can we pr- keep the steelhead from breeding, uh, this, the, you'd come up with a system pretty much like the one we we have. Uh, I, I do take comfort though in that the steelhead. That, you know, there are, there are rainbow trout that have run out to sea, and I fish for them. They say they're the fish of a thousand casts, and I've cast a thousand times in one day, no doubt, <laughs> figuring it out, and never caught one or even got a strike. So uh, you have to be very patient and really enjoy it. But they go out to sea, and you hold, when you catch one and hold it in your hand, this fish may have been to the Sea of Japan and back. And that's another wonderful mystic thing to to ponder. But the steelhead are not going extinct. They, they're not in the San Inez River anymore. But sooner or later, the works of man are not going to be blocking the, the San Inez River. Either we will take them down or they will simply be taken down by nature and the steelhead will run up there once again. Whether we will be around to see that is, is a, an open question right now, but I'm confident it will happen. So, uh, but of course, once you drive a species to extinction, there's no extinct species that has ever reappeared. So that's a one way 
trip to oblivion, but I, I don't, I believe there's so many steelhead in the ocean and I, I, and they know their natal stream somehow they, they smell it somehow they do it. And so I think, um, and there are a few getting up there and, and nesting. So I think it, it, that won't be, they won't be extinct. They will, they were there to come back when the door is open, so to speak. When we take our boot off of nature. Yeah. <laughs> well, one so, way or another, right? Yeah. So, so there's mysticism that a, that a steelhead or a salmon can be off the coast of California or Oregon and can know that 1700 miles inland is the place it needs to get to to spawn yes i'm sure i know that biologists have spent a lot of time trying to figure out how that can be but when you finally get a description it doesn't get you any farther from mysticism that there's a magic there yes that's exactly right yeah there's some scientific explanation and that's nice to know but it's just a, a wonderful thing to think how evolution has produced this creature that can find its way hundreds, even thousands of miles, as you said, back to where it was born. I don't really focus on the scientific reason for that. I, I know there is one, and I, but I, I just focus on the wonder. You're listening to the Thomas Jefferson Hour. This week, a one-on-one -on -one conversation between Clay Jenkinson and James Powell. We'll be back in just a moment. Welcome back to the Thomas Jefferson Hour. We'll continue this one-on-one -on -one conversation. Uh, Clay, but before we do, tell me about this upcoming Water in the West Humanities course that you have. I've been doing these online courses now since the pandemic began. They've turned out to be just enormously uh, satisfying to me. And we gather people from all over the country, even all over the world, on Zoom on Saturdays to talk about the Enlightenment or uh, Virgil's Aeneid or the literature of pandemics or the Constitution, which we've done now three times and will do again. This one's on water in the West, and it's based on a retreat that I hosted out at Locksaw Lodge a couple of years ago. This is going to be the issue of the rest of the century, and the Colorado Basin is over-allocated, overcharged, and in real crisis. But we also were able to talk about the Columbia Basin, which has more dams than almost any other river in the world. Um, much to the detriment of the salmon. Uh, and we talked about the Missouri Basin. And I know you and I see abundance here with the Missouri River, but the Missouri is so heavily industrialized uh, and there are so many claimants. The damming of the Missouri came at not just a cost to the environment, but a colossal cost to the Mandan, the Hidatsa, and the Arikara people whose, whose homelands, whose primary agricultural acreage, 155,000 acres right down on the river, uh, were inundated by Garrison Dam, and it was a, a really almost a holocaust for the three affiliated tribes. Before we go back to the conversation with Mr. Powell, people who are interested in this course, they can go to jeffersonhour.com. I'm assuming all the information is there. Yes. Go to jeffersonhour.com. You'll find out the, the schedule of the courses. It begins uh, on February 19th, so coming up very quickly. And it goes for a number of weeks. There are also um, optional office hours on Wednesday evenings. It's just so much fun. No quizzes, no exams, no essays. It's just a way to talk about really important issues. Not technically so much, but from the perspective of the humanities. Very good. Let's return to this conversation between you and Mr. Powell now. I'm talking to James Lawrence Powell, the author of Deadpool, Lake Powell, Global Warming, and the Future of Water in the West. Back way up, what took you to this place? How did you come to write these two books, one on the Grand Canyon and one on Deadpool, on, on Lake Powell and the future of uh, the Colorado River dams? I'm a geologist. I began teaching geology as a professor at Oberlin College in Ohio, a very fine liberal arts college. I'm proud to have been there. I was even the acting president at one point, but I missed uh, lots of things about geology, like being, being out in the field, but also doing research and learning and contributing to knowledge. And I couldn't do that while I was a, a university president or museum director. So I got the idea of writing science books. I felt that as a former professor, I had learned how to explain science to non-scientists, at least I hoped I had. 
Some people said I did. And so I decided to think about writing books. And the first book that caught my attention, or the first topic that caught my attention, was the extinction of the dinosaurs, which had been a mystery, some would say the greatest mystery in science, for 150 years. And then in 1980, a pair of scientists, a father and son team, Louis Alvarez and Walter Alvarez, had to come up with the evidence that the cause of dinosaur extinction had been the impact of an asteroid. That theory was very much debated. It was very controversial. And so I wondered, what is that the answer? Was that true? And I decided to research it and write a book about it. And I did. I called it Ninth Comes to the Cretaceous. Mm -hmm. So I wrote that book and it got pretty good receipt and not receipts in terms of finance, but a pretty good reception, let's say. So I started looking for another topic. And when I was a geology student, we learned that the cause of the Grand Canyon was that a ancestor of the Colorado River was flowing over what would become the Colorado Plateau. I would be making gestures if I weren't on Zoom. The minor might not help. And then the Colorado Plateau began to rise up under the ancestral Colorado River. And so two things could happen. One, the, the plateau could have risen so fast that it blocked the river and diverted it off to some other place. Or the second would be what you were talking about. Uh, the river is energetic enough, and now it has to spend all its energy cutting straight down to keep up. And we know it kept up because there it is. It cuts through the Colorado Plateau, so there's no doubt that it did. But it didn't, it didn't go through serpentine bends on the way down because uh, that would require a lot more rock cutting. So, th so that was the theory, a river flowing over a plateau, the plateau rises, the river has to cut down, you get a gorge. That's the John and, Wesley Powell theory. Yes, that was Powell's theory, my ancestor, but not relative, sad to say. And then I, in an, around early 2000s, I read somewhere about a conference at the, held at the Grand Canyon on the rim, South Rim, I think it was, uh, among geologists to debate the origin of the Grand Canyon. And I said, what? You mean this wasn't settled uh, 150 years ago or something? Well, no. So uh, I, I wrote a book about the Colorado River. I called it uh, Grand Canyon, Solving Earth's Grandest Problem, or puzzle, I think I said. And one reason I, I chose that title was if you had to think of one of the most obvious geologic features Certainly in North America, maybe in the Western Hemisphere, you would pick the Grand Canyon. You can see it from space, right? And yet here geologists are arguing about the origin of this most obvious feature and that there's got to be a story there. So I wrote Grand Canyon. That got me a little more knowledgeable about the river and the dams. And I got interested in global warming, which people were already saying, scientists were already saying was going to reduce the flow of the river. And I knew that we were already using every drop of the Colorado. There was no surplus. So if you cut down the supply and the demand doesn't go down, you're going to have a big problem. So that's what led me to write Deadpool. And uh, I, I would say that in each of these three cases, dinosaur extinction, the Grand Canyon, and the bed, dead pool topic, I knew very little when I began. And so I had to learn about it as I went along. You took on some very big projects here, the Grand Canyon, uh, the, the extinction of the dinosaurs, um, and then uh, the problem of, of, of the Colorado River. Um, over allocation and now well warning and it can be said you were ahead of your time you know this book deadpool was warning us about this before this became part of the general vocabulary of scientifically minded amateurs that, that this was 15 years or so ahead of its time so there's an amazing thing that you were predicting these problems and now they've come to pass probably in ways that even surpassed your concerns then Yes, that, that everything you said there is very apt. Um, I, I did the research for Deadpool roughly 2005. By the time it came out, it was a few years later. You know how that goes. I, I have something uh, on my website now. Actually, I have a uh, 
link to the first interview you and I had, but I also say that in this book, I predicted exactly what has happened on the Colorado River. And this didn't, I say, this didn't take a genius, just a scientist who accepts global warming, which many, which the Bureau of Reclamation and many Western water managers did not uh, 15 or 16 years ago. So I, I don't feel I, that I, I did something remarkable. It, it was sort of obvious. Uh, John Wesley Powell said to assembled water people in Montana in the 18... 1889, I think it was. Yes, he said, gentlemen, something like this, there is not going to be enough water. And I, I cite that. I have that quote, and you, you probably know that quote. And uh, that was true then. And it, it was true when I wrote Deadpool, and it's true now. But now we know in spades that it's true. And one thing that is... I still uh, have trouble getting my head around it. When I first first started learning about global warming, which I had to do because, like most scientists, to say by the early 2000s, I I accepted that it was reality. I uh, accepted what most scientists were saying, but I never really looked into it myself. And so I began to do that. And the first thing I discovered was that there was a small group of scientists, dip dissidents, or I would call them deniers now, who came up with all sorts of false reasons why global warming was not happening, could not happen. And that surprised me that there were people who would simply ignore the evidence. But then I thought that wisdom would prevail, which I must say maybe a false assumption <laughs> from now on, if it hasn't been for a long time, wisdom did not prevail. I thought that global warming is so obviously happening. Uh, it's uh, basic physics is all that's behind it. Uh, and it's so threatening that surely we will do something about it. I thought the public would have the wisdom to elect people who supported science, believed in science. And when I gave talk, I've given many talks, and you, as you have, about, I've given talks about global warming, about these books and so forth. And people say, well, Dr. Powell, what should we do about this? And I said, don't vote for anyone who doesn't accept science. It's just that simple. But we don't. We haven't. So it, I find myself going down a road to despair here if I, when I start thinking and talking this way. I just couldn't imagine that we'd ever get to this point, and yet we have. Back to this really extraordinary book, Deadpool. Um, yes. John Wesley Powell, one of my heroes, and I think one of your heroes, came out into the West because he was a man of deep curiosity. He was restless. He didn't find enough for him in Illinois. Uh, so he made those two preliminary trips, one to uh, Pikes Peak and climbed it, and then to Long's Peak. And then he got the idea, probably from Jack Sumner, uh, that it might be interesting to float the Colorado River and its canyons. And so he did that, of course, in 1869 and again in 1871 and 72. He wrote a, a really interesting sort of um, overwrought book about it, but nevertheless, a kind of Victorian account of what he had experienced there and collapsed the two trips into one. And there are some issues about it. But what he discovered in those journeys was that there is a fundamental truth in North American life, which is the 100th meridian is essentially the line of demarcation between places where crops will grow routinely. And then there's the land beyond the 100th meridian where you might get a crop two times out of 10 or one time out of 10. And so he realized that two fifths of continental United States was arid or semi arid, and it wasn't going to be developed. It, it could not be developed according to the, the protocols, the, the, the paradigms and the software that had generated uh, the immense productivity of, of the Mississippi river Valley, et cetera. And so he said the hundredth meridian has to be, more important than just a line um, in the world's longitudinal system. It really tells you that the West is going to have to be developed in a very different way if it's going to be developed at all. That's the key insight, isn't it? Yes, he had the key insight. There's not going to be enough water west of the 100th meridian. The, the fact that John Wesley Powell told us by building these big dams, it's really rather remarkable that 
we've been able to do as well as we have while population in the Southwest has grown by leaps and bounds. Even when I began looking into this, uh, there was no surplus water. Population was already taking, and agriculture, already taking all the water there was. The, the basic facts that led him to say that are eternal, you might say, oh, maybe not on a geologic time scale, but you're, you're talking about how much rain, annual rainfall is there. And if you divide that rainfall up, how much agriculture and many, how many crops can you grow? And as you said, it doesn't doesn't compute. So you have to do something different. And we've done it by building these big dams. Uh, but as I've said, their days are numbered. Uh, and we are seeing now, even without global warming, let me back up a second there a bit. Uh, even without global warming, I think what the Southwest is unsustainable right now because uh, more, more and more people are still moving there and they're demanding water uh, and they will expect it when they turn the spigot in their new house the, the water will come flowing out but global warming is now putting an end to that and it it whatever he meant exactly there's not going to be enough water well there's going to be less than he thought even less than he thought i do believe though that there is enough water to sustain the southwest for a number of decades, possibly well in, toward the end of the century, if we greatly reduced the amount that's going to agriculture and we made sure we growed, grew only essential crops, not alfalfa, not cotton, where you almonds where you have to have huge irrigation. And if we enforced conservation, in my uh, book, uh, the 2084 report, I have a chapter on Arizona where this my protagonist remembers when he was a boy, he opens, there's a knock on the door, he opens the, the door and there's two men standing there in uniform. One has a big 45 on his holster and they say, you're using too much water, we're cutting you off. And uh, that, that kind of thing is going to happen. So I, I don't think it's hopeless. Now, the long-term future, if we don't do anything about global warming, now let's say I'm into the into the next century, then I don't even want to think about it. I have children and grandchildren. I, I can hardly bear to think about it. But I do think we, if we could, we we have a a window here where we could get control of water usage in the Southwest, uh, prevent further growth, et cetera, the things I've said, and get several more decades, maybe half a century of time to get a handle on global warming. But the longer we wait, the worse the problem is with global warming. Absolutely. So just I want to go quickly to, to what I regard as a second insight, that there isn't enough water west of the 100th meridian, although there are spots where there is. Uh, but more than that, the water doesn't appear evenly across that vast landscape. In Iowa, you can count on rain essentially serving the entire state. Uh, that it's more or less even across the state over time and in Ohio and in Arkansas. But west of the 100th meridian, you can't count on the water falling where it needs to, falling evenly. And therefore, the people who live next to water courses are the winners, and the people who live away from water courses are the losers. And that's why he wanted to completely redo the rectangular cadastral survey grid system into a long lot system and so on, because he realized that that you can't homestead a place in Wyoming where there's no water. It's just not going to work out <laughs> People for People tried it, though. <laughs> the country refused to listen to him and brought a lot of, of hardship and maybe even tragedy in the basis of this. So he was a prophet ahead of his time. But I want to turn to the question of consequences and unintended consequences. So Powell said in that last great speech that he gave that there isn't enough water to do even a fraction of the things you're intending to do here. If you took every cubic inch of water out of every river in the West, you might be able to irrigate three, maybe 5% of that land, but you're never going to make the West bloom in any kind of a universal way. And we've done that. We've now essentially reached that, that statistical limit of how much you can irrigate. What he couldn't understand then uh, was certainly global warming. We'll come back to that. But he didn't understand that rivers have purposes beyond delivering cubic inches of waters for cotton and alfalfa, that there's biota, 
that there's downstream that there need to, you need to maintain in-stream flows that a watershed is a very 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 complex eco, uh, ecological system he looked on rivers with greater fullness than most people but he still didn't see the whole picture and how much diverting that much water has damaged these river watershed systems true he couldn't possibly have imagined hoover dam you're listening to the thomas jefferson hour this week a special one-on-one conversation between clay jenkinson and mr james powell we're going to take a short break but we'll be back in just a moment Welcome back to this special edition of the Thomas Jefferson Hour. It's our one-on-one series. Occasionally I interview somebody where David is not available, and we then feature highlights of those interviews here on the Jefferson Hour. You can go to governing.com to hear more of these interviews and podcasts. But David, this is a really extraordinary man. I asked him in this interview, if you were the water czar, if we gave you unlimited power to determine the future of water in the West, what would you do? We should listen to that segment now because it is just so very interesting. Very good. Let's go to it. But what about a principled person like you, but who is a a water optimist and a climate quasi skeptic? In other words, is there some, are there people that you respect who take a, a sunnier view of all of this and they're not just speaking nonsense? They're, they're, they're trying to, to do the math and to and to account for climate variations and wet cycles and dry cycles and so on. I don't know of a scientist that that's true of. I don't know if you know this, but uh, one of the things I've done recently is try to evaluate the strength of the consensus among scientists on anthropogenic global warming. And I read the abstracts and titles of 21,000 peer-reviewed scientific articles in 2019, mostly the titles, because that's all you could accomplish. I did not find a single article in which the scientist authors said global warming is false or even likely to be false, or even it's nothing to worry about. So scientists are uniform about this as they are almost never are about anything complicated. So here we have a scientific near certainty. So the only question scientists have <laughs> is how, much, how should we tell the story to the public? And I know people thought that in my book, the 2084 report, I'm not plugging it. I'm just thinking of it. I was too alarmist. I, w- I went too far that we, we can't scare people because they'll give up. But I felt you know something, it's like your doctor. If your doctor knows you have a terminal disease, he or she should tell you and not say, well, old so-and-so is going to kick the bucket in, in a year, and why not just let him live out that year? This, this, may become, this is something I may be facing before too long. Who knows? I'm getting up in well into my 80s now. But um, I, I don't regret at all the tone that I took because I felt I needed to warn people as to how bad global warming could be if we don't stop it. When I first began uh, reading about it, there was uh, people who said, oh, don't worry, we'll just wear T-shirts. That was the sort of throwaway line. And I tried to describe the opposite of that. Uh, here in North Dakota, they say, we'll have, we'll have milder winters. We'll have a longer growing season. What's the downside? And, yeah. of course, that's such a simpleton sort of view of it. But I guess my the point I'm trying to make is, well, let me ask it in a different way. Let's say that somebody who was a conservative believer in our capacity to in, through ingenuity and engineering to solve all problems, and there are plenty of such people who are listening to this, would they say to you, oh, come on? I mean, is there a, is there a position for skepticism? Obviously, all scientists are skeptics, but is there a position for principled skepticism about the alarm? I don't believe there is. I I think it's a scientific fact that human activities are causing global warming and it's it's going to be dangerous. We know how much carbon dioxide is going to rise in the atmosphere and we know how much of a temperature increase each amount of carbon dioxide produces. So there's just no escaping. If we don't start reducing the amount of carbon dioxide from fossil fuels we put in the atmosphere, then Global warming is an inevitable fact of science. 
So I don't know if I'm responding or not, but that's the best I can say. <laughs> no, I, I, I can't budge you from your position, and I'm not trying to, but I'm trying to anticipate how a conservative, pro-progress, pro-industrial sort of person might try to figure this out. So how can you account for the fact that a major party of people that can hire the best consultants, the best engineers, the best scientists in the world can willfully be in denial about something that you regard as an um, incontrovertible truth? Is it because they it's, it's convenient for them to be pro-business and not to want to throw a wrench into this system that's produced so much prosperity? Is it because this is too big a problem for us to get our heads around and we just assume that humans can't possibly have that much of an impact on the biosphere? Is it just self-serving or is it is is it psychologically revealing of human nature? It's a very good question. Uh, we are in an era where people seem to feel they can choose what facts they want to, they will accept. And of course, you they accept whatever reinforces their, their political position. Uh, these are huge problems that are a real threat to beyond global warming that are a threat to democracy as well as global warming. I have always believed that if you could make people realize what their grandchildren's lives may be like in, let's say, 2084, 60, not a little more than 60 years from now, if, if you could get them to see that, they would stop and, and rethink it. But it, it doesn't seem to be happening. And uh, I, I really... All I can do is despair at this point and try to do my best to write accurate science and hope that there are events, this is about all I can think of, that there will be a series, a set of natural disasters. People used to say we need a Pearl Harbor to make people decide it kind of event. But now I think we're probably not going to do anything until there are a number of Pearl Harbor scale events around the world, and it becomes impossible to deny that this is happening, and the public will rise up and insist that politicians do something about it, the first step of which would be to accept that man-made global warming is happening, it's our fault, and it's dangerous. We live in a terrible time in this, in this respect. How can you not feel the most profound despair in having to utter those last paragraphs that that humans are in a position more than ever before in the history of the planet to know exactly what's going on that there can be no doubt about our metrics and that even if this is part of some periodicity in the world's climate it's still absolutely in our interest to address this in a forthright way and to limit our carbon emissions and so on how can you not feel just like the American experiment has failed because the American people are not up to the simple challenge of facing the science that's glaring them in the face as, as the temperatures <laughs> rise and the tornadoes get worse and the hurricanes get more massive and so on? You put it very well. I don't even know how I can manage to come up with a smile. Uh, <laughs> here we are staring a doomsday into, at a doomsday scenario. You know, your best case scenario is a series of Pearl Harbors that shake us to the bone. That wasn't my dream of America. No, mine either. When, when you and I were youngsters, uh, that if somebody said, this is what it's going to be like in 2021, we would never have believed it. We would have said that's impossible. Not 10 years ago, would we have believed it? No, we wouldn't. No, it's, it's, a sh it's shocking uh, how rapidly it's, uh, how it's come, on, come upon us. I have always had one idea that I haven't seen put into practice yet, but you sort of hinted at this. You, what I might say to someone who was the, the uh, responsible skeptic that you described is that, well, let's not even talk about what's causing global warming, but here's the evidence that it's happening. And it, we know it's a scientific fact that if we could reduce the amount of carbon, we would bring temperatures down and the world would be a lot better off because we wouldn't depend on meter, Middle Eastern oil and so forth. That, that seems to me to be, uh, and I've, I've tried that on some people and they, they listen. Uh, but now I, I don't know if I tried that on uh, some of the members of Congress. I don't even think you could 
get an audience with them in which they would even listen to that. I think early on in this interview, they would have um, interrupted to say we're both just full of beans and that, they were, that we're obviously leftists and that we hate this country um, and that we want to destroy the economy. Um, and that we don't understand the genius of America and our capacity to engineer our way out of anything, um, and that we are taking ourselves much, 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 much too seriously as humans in the face of the magnitude of the biosphere. I, I can hear that. I, mean, I get that every single day of my life. So you must be getting it in some measure. Yes. And so you think, well, then, okay, what's it going to take? 12 Pearl Harbors? or 12 Pearl Harbor squared, that's one thing. What's it going to take educationally? What's it going to take for the American people to say, you know, uh, Professor Powell is probably right about this. I think we passed the point where we could have proactively gotten ahead of global warming. And that, that probably was eight or 10 years ago. Uh, I was referring back to when John McCain was accepting global warming and proposing legislation and so forth. We, we had a window there, uh, and somewhere along the way, uh, somehow it became, basically, if you look at what societies have turned their back on science as national policy, you have uh, the Soviet Union and Lysenkoism, where uh, Stalin supported this uh, crackpot biologists and millions and millions of people died. Same thing happened in China. Uh, you have Mbeki in South Africa who said AIDS is not caused by HIV and so on and so forth. I mean, any time a, a society has rejected some important issue of science, death has followed. And uh, we are going down that path. And I, again, I can only hope, I don't believe that logic and reason are going to convince the deniers. It's going to take when something in their congressional district is destroyed and you can point the finger at global warming as, a, as at least a major part of the cause. That's where I am. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm trying to put together a Grand Canyon trip. John Wesley Powell in the Grand Canyon. Dories, um, professional outfitters, all safe and secure. If I did that, is there any way you would want to come on such a thing as a guest? Possibly. I just had two friends who did it, one of whom is almost my age, and they hired an outfitter, to a river running outfitter to do, and they went in wooden dories. It took about two weeks and they had a, they had a fantastic trip. So I don't know who does this now, but that's one. I've got a friend who does it, and, and he, he doesn't do it himself, but he knows the people who do it, and they make it friendly for people that are yeah. you know, not in their 30s. So I think it would be fantastic, if, even if you could do it, even if you could come for part of it. But it would be a real highlight for me if we could do this, and you would be a, a guest of ours, and we would, at night we would sit around the fire and wring our hands about the future of the world. <laughs> With something we brought along to imbibe, I'm sure I would love to do that, partly because you're inviting me and it would be a chance to spend some time. You said, let's do a project together. Well, uh, that, that's a that's a that's, that's an project. adventure. We need a project, too. But but so what is your drink of choice? Uh, malt whiskey, Lafroig. Lafroig is a Scott malt scotch. <laughs> L-A-P-H. R O A I G or something like that. La Freud. La Freud. That uh, I'll I'll have a case of it. You know, we should read the uh, the the Archdruid and the whatever it is John McPhee's book as we go down, and we should read Edward Abbey's great essay Down the River with Thoreau, which is one of my very favorite essays by. I've not read that. You got to read that. So it, it's called Down the River with Thoreau, and he he's on he's in Glen Canyon before the dam is uh, completed. Yeah. And, you know, he's drinking too much and he's pontificating too much, but it's still great. And he's reading Walden. And so he's reflecting yeah, I, on Thoreau. I it's, love it. It's, it's I a love marvelous it. essay. I loved your book on 2084. So I think one thing that, you know, I've been, I've been trying to convince you to do the thing on the Colorado River Compact, but another one that just came to mind is a book about the times when humans have failed to listen to science, the Russian example, the Chinese example. Man, do we need that short book of about 140 pages that says, look what happens when humans fail to listen to science. I could do that. 
I've written about it. I, uh, I'll, I'll think about that. I'm at a point where I'm sort of looking for a new project, writing project. Well, you've uh, already spoken of several of these instances. And so if even if you started with what you know, like these three or four, but a book that just said, when humans turn their backs on science that is irrefutable, here are the results. Is this what we really want to be doing as a people? And I think that book could get some attention. Um, I can see you on the talk shows uh, convincing the country is the best you can. I'd love to see that. I'll think about that. That's a topic that is important. I agree exactly. If you, if you could make people face that, you're denying science, the, the unanimous view of scientists, and here's, here's what happens to society. If you show that this happened, this exact thing happened uh, to the to the famine of the Ukraine or whatever, um, that there were enough examples and they realized that, that maybe we can't see what's right in front of our noses, but we can see historical examples of how this can go so terribly wrong. Yeah. Worcester, Worcester, in a sense, did some of that in his book, Rivers of Empire. Yes. He, he talked about irrigation societies that got out of control and, and disappeared. Yeah. That was and a great the deforestation book. of the Mediterranean. Uh, that you know, I just was reading about this today. Uh, Marsh's book from the 1880s about deforestation in the Mediterranean, and how he believed that was the collapse of the Roman Empire. Mar Marsh in the 1880s. Yeah, yeah. Just send me reading. send me that reference. I will. I got to go. You got to go. Okay. But I'm so pleased for this. Oh, thank you so much, Clay. It's always great to talk with you. I'm talk glad to you soon, my friend. I'm glad we met. Bye bye. Me too. Me too. Thank you. Really an interesting conversation. You know, I have to confess, I have not read this book, um, but I intend to now. Yeah, so I was at Lake Mead this summer. I climbed Mount Whitney uh, with several friends, and then we went to Las Vegas to um, drink as much liquid, some of it water, as we possibly could after that ordeal. Uh, and we went out, at my suggestion, to Hoover Dam. I love Hoover Dam. I think it's one of the most extraordinary places in America. Uh, there is a, a, a statue group to the in honor of the workers that is just magnificent, and the dam itself is, is just a work of art in addition to a great moment in human engineering. And uh, what we saw, David, was the bathtub ring. The Lake Mead is so far down that it's 100 feet down from its fill, more. And you can see where uh, how much the water has declined of course, this is a this is a lake of more than a hundred miles in length, and behind it is is Glen Canyon Dam and Lake Powell, and that's even longer in length. And they're both not quite dry, but desperately low, and no end in sight. And so, this book was published in 2008, Deadpool. It turned out to be absolutely prophetic. And what James Lawrence Powell says is, you can have one, but not both. You can have Lake Powell, but not Lake Mead. Or you can have Lake Mead, but not Lake Powell, but they will never again both be full unless some catastrophic change occurs in the climate of the Southwest. We'll see you all next week for another exciting edition of the Thomas Jefferson Hour. The Thomas Jefferson Hour is brought to you each week by Dakota Sky Education. The program is distributed nationally by Prairie Public. President Thomas Jefferson lived from 1743 to 1826, and this program presents his views. President Jefferson is portrayed by the award-winning humanities scholar and author Clay S. Jenkinson. To obtain a copy of this or any show for a $12 donation, please call 701-575-0727. This program is also available online at jeffersonhour.com and on Apple Podcasts. If you'd like to correspond with President Jefferson or submit a question for him to answer on the program, please visit the website at jeffersonhour.com. The Thomas Jefferson Hour is produced at Makoche Recording Studios in Bismarck, North Dakota. Bach Cello Suite No. 3 in C Major by Stephen Swinford. Thank you for listening. Please tune in again next week for another thought-provoking historically accurate program through the eyes of Thomas Jefferson.